Hi, I'm Tommy Thomas. I want to welcome you back to the show, How to Beat the Odds. If you've watched the show before, you know that I begin every show talking about the devil and the demons and how real they are. Why do I do that? Because I get mad every time I think about how they kept me from God's will, plan, and purpose for 32 years. God called me at 19 and I walked away from what God had called me to do. Became a card shark, a card cheater, so my dad would love me and respect me and I'd feel accepted. I wasn't worried about being accepted by my heavenly father. I was more concerned about my earthly father who didn't know Jesus. Most famous gambler in the world, Titanic Thompson. Yeah, I wanted my dad to love me. He left when I was four years old and I said, that's how I'll get him to do it. I'll become a world-class professional gambler. I went off and missed God's plan for 32 years. And those old devil and the demons, they would always put thoughts in my head. And, you know, I needed all the money that came from that lifestyle. I needed all the jewelry and fancy cars and speedboats and nice homes and the girlfriends and how I had to have all that stuff. But you know, God never gives up on any of us. And he called me to preach the gospel at 19, but I didn't listen. But because God didn't give up, I fell down on my knees when I was 50 years old, 10 years ago, and cried out to God and said, God, I've been taken all my life. I want to give something back, God. If I die, I want somebody to remember me for something besides taking. And I cried and I wept before the Lord. God had been waiting 32 years to hear those words come out of my mouth. Well, I'm so excited about my guest today John Coors. He was raised in a wealthy family, had a lot of nice things growing up, dealt with some of the issues that that brings into our life. In fact, he was a young boy and, and one of his friends came up and rubbed his hand and there was some dirt on it. And he rubbed the dirt off of his hand and John rubbed his hand. There wasn't any dirt. And his little friend said, see, you're a rich kid. You're clean. Well, that affected him. And I know what that was like because I was raised in a wealthy family too. And I was embarrassed about certain things. But he went on, went on to school, got born again at an early age, and got a hold of God's plan for his life. And I'm so excited about what he's doing now for God. So right now I want to introduce you to him and let him share his testimony and what all he's doing for God right now. Let's meet John Coors. John, welcome to How to Beat the Odds. Thank you, Tommy. I met you, I guess, about six months ago over a friend of mine, Ann Holland's house. Yes, sir. And you were talking about some of the things that are going on today. But I would like to go back when you were a young man. You told me that your mother was a Christian. Yes. And you were born again at an early age. At six years old. Six years old. And you knew that you were born again. I do. That's one of the, one of the only memories I have from that period of my life. Wow. Kneeling down by the chair next to my mom's bed and asking Jesus into my heart at six years old. Awesome memory, isn't it? Yeah. And you can always look back and get a hold of that, yes. too. Now, your dad was not a Christian. No, not at that point in his life. He became a Christian only shortly before he died. Okay, now your father was the head of the Coors. No, well, he's part, part of the Coors part family. Part of the Coors family. Yeah. And you're part of the Coors I family, the, the Coors. brewery family. Yes, All right. So you were raised around that. Yes, sir. Okay, now you went on to college back in where? Colorado? Back in Colorado, the Colorado School of Mines. School of Mines. That's yeah. an excellent, that's an engineering that's school. That's an engineering school. Yes, sir. Okay. And I'm an engineer. I'm a chemical engineer. All right. And you also went to work at the brewery, I believe, when you were like 21? I was actually, I, I worked summers and part-time while I was going to college and then uh, started full-time when I was 23. Okay. Now, did God deal with you about working in a brewery and being a Christian? How did that work? <laughs> uh, well, it's an interesting question because... Uh, Oftentimes in Christian circles, the idea of alcohol and Christianity don't mix very well. And so I had that, I had that issue. I had, how do, how do I reconcile those two things together? And uh, when I was praying about it one day and asking the Lord if it was okay to go work at the brewery, then what he said to me was, you know, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of his heart. And so that was a testimony to me and a, and a confirmation to me that it was his plan for me to begin work at the brewery. Okay, now you were 21 when you met your wife, I believe? Yes. Okay, now you have a couple of children. How many children all together did you and her have together? We have four biological children, okay. and uh, we've adopted five, so we have nine total. Nine children all together. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, and you had a little reservation about adopting your first child, didn't you? Yes, I, uh, I had never known children that were adopted. I hadn't ever, um, it's just something I didn't know anything about. But my wife helped with uh, the airlift of the Vietnam children, children coming out of Vietnam, and her family had helped uh, raise some of those and help place some of them. So she had a heart from an early age for adoption. And so when we could, ha could not have any more children of our own, we began the discussions about adoption. And it took me years until God spoke to my heart and said, this is something I want you to do. It was a very concrete step uh, of something I could do to help uh, with, the, quite frankly, the issue of abortion and uh, the children that aren't wanted and are discarded. And God said, that's something you can do to help at least one of those children. The first one was a Japanese child? First one, his, uh, his birth mother is Japanese. Uh, he was conceived in Japan and uh, she came to the U.S. to have the, our little Joshua. So we got to see him at 10 minutes old in the hospital. Wow. Yeah. And that just really did a work in your heart from then Changed on. Changed my it? heart. Absolutely. Changed your heart. Yeah. Now, let's go back to your dad just a minute. Now, he, um, he had a heart attack, a very serious heart attack, but he survived the heart attack. Uh, but he was going in for bypass surgery. Uh, and it was going into that bypass surgery where the, the uh, doctors told him they weren't sure if he'd come out. And at that point, he, he really had to face eternity and the fact that he was mortal. And at that point, he opened up his heart uh, to Jesus. Wow, you may be watching this show. You've got a family member and you've been praying for them and believing for them to accept Jesus. It doesn't matter if they're 80 years old, 90 years old. You keep on praying and you keep on believing and God will make a way for their heart to receive the love of Jesus Christ. It's so important to never give up. Well, isn't that exciting to know yeah. that you were there and your dad gave his heart to the yes, Lord and you're going to be with your dad for eternity I'm now. That's a great that's feeling, a isn't it? <laughs> oh man, that's yeah. so awesome. Yeah. Okay, now you also adopted a child from Africa. Yes. And you were going to Africa and God gave you a vision and you wanted to find out about his heritage yes. in Africa. Yes. Uh, at, a, at a certain point in my life, when I was, um, had been working at the brewery for 13 years, uh, God put a choice in front of me, uh, a career choice really. And, uh, and I knew what God wanted me to do and that was to leave the brewery. I had spent my entire um, educational experience, my whole life growing up around it. I believe I you told me you were about to be the, uh, elevated, elevated to the top of, the, of your position there. Yes, the, uh, and, and it was at that point God said, you have a choice to make. You can, take, you can take the position that you've been preparing for your entire life, or you can take a hard choice and do something new that you don't know what it is yet. And, but I knew what God wanted me to do, and so with a wonderful supporting wife, we made the decision to take the hard choice. And that began me down a, a new path, yeah, which has brought me to where we are today. And that's a faith walk. That's a faith walk, yeah. The, the beauty of that 13 year stint that I spent at the brewery was I learned a lot of lessons. God had lots to teach me in that period of time that I would use later in life. So it wasn't a waste of time, it wasn't a mistake. God did ask me to go there, but then he asked me to do something different. Wow. Well, we're going to take a break right now. We'll be right back after the break and we'll talk to John some more about the vision God gave him and how God prepared him all along the way to be able to do what God had called him to do. We'll be right back. Think I'll go down to the river. Think I'll take myself a swim. Let the water cover over me, be refreshed again. Oh, be refreshed again. Oh, there's a river flowing deep within me. Living water, bringing peace. A steady rhythm of His mercy and grace is flowing out of me. Oh, it's flowing out of me. Oh. Yeah. 
this river makes the lame to walk and dead to rise this river mends broken hearts and opens blind eyes this river fully satisfies where this river flows everything will live where this river flows everything And I'm thankful for this river Living water from within Because these abundant waters flow I'll never thirst again Oh, I'll never thirst again Oh to rise this river mends broken hearts and opens blind eyes this river fully satisfies where this river flows everything will live where this river flows everything Think I'll go down to the river Think I'll take myself a swim Let the water cover over me Be refreshed again Oh, be refreshed again Oh, Welcome back. I've been talking to my guest, John Coors. He's been telling us how God changed the direction of his life. Here he was at the peak of his career in the Coors industry, working for the brewery, going all the way to the top, worked for years to get there. And then God spoke a word to him and said, now you have to make a choice. Do you want to do it the world's way and do what you've accomplished? Or do you want to take a step of faith and step out and do what I have for you to do? Not an easy choice but that's why they call this a faith walk. And John made that decision to do it God's way, not knowing what all God had waiting for him, but he chose to do it God's way. And that's what God wants from every one of us. Not sacrifice, but obedience. It might've looked like a sacrifice at the time in the natural, but when we see through the eyes of Jesus and know that God's plan is bigger than anything we could possibly do on our own, and we get a hold of that truth and we step out in faith and do it His way, God will step up to the plate and all the dreams and visions he's given us will come to pass if we'll just wait on him. Well, John, you made that choice. Yes, sir. And now you got in another business, which was electricity, solar, solar. electricity, yes. and you were in that business for a while. And that business really showed you that a large part of the world is without electricity. That's right. I didn't, I knew nothing about electricity or the distribution of electricity when I started that job. But I learned early on that a third of the world does not have access to electricity. And then God blessed you with a wonderful wife and children, and then God put it in your heart to adopt children. Yes. And one of those children was from Uganda, Africa. Actually, Kenya. Kenya, Africa, okay. <laughs> now, you wanted to find out about the heritage of your child. Yes. So you took a trip to Kenya, Africa. Yes, I, I, after we adopted Noah, who was our fourth adopted child, I took our fourth biological child with me, and we flew from Denver to Amsterdam, and from Amsterdam down to Nairobi, Kenya. And that flight from Amsterdam to Nairobi is a nighttime flight. And so as we were flying from Amsterdam to Nairobi, it was uh, pitch black, no moon, and I woke up in the middle of the night and as I looked out the window, what I saw was the ed edge of the Sahara Desert, the southern edge of the Sahara Desert, and we began to move into Sub-Saharan Africa. 
And in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, 800 million people live. As I looked out that window, I saw not a single light, even though I knew there were millions of people down there. And at that moment, God spoke into my heart and said, John, I want you to do something about that. And then he gave me the plan. And the plan is what has now become known as the circle of light. Well, you came to my friend Ann Hollins about six months ago and you shared with a group of us there about this plan. And explain a little bit about it to our viewers today. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty simple thing uh, that we're trying to accomplish. You know, in, in uh, most of Africa, in three quarters of the households of Africa, that's 600 million people, they still light their homes with these little, um, uh, what they call candles. It's a kerosene, it's a tin can filled with kerosene with a little wick, and that's all they have for lighting in their homes. They cook with wood. They have to go out and uh, chop trees down, chop forests down to get wood and uh, to cook with. And so women are going for hours and hours. Uh, on average in Kenya, it's eight hours a day just foraging firewood to be able to cook meals for their families. And so uh, we have brought a simple approach using uh, propane as the fuel source for lighting and cooking in these communities in a way that's sustainable uh, and should be sustainable for decades to come. Okay, well now, I know when we watched the presentation you did over there, it showed a little generator and then you, you have the propane yes. that controls the generator and it controls the little light bulb and at the same time it has a cook stove so that they can cook on it. Is that how it works? Well, almost. Okay. We use, uh, we, we transport energy two ways. One is in a propane cylinder like we use on our barbecues. Right. And that's how they transport propane back and forth to their homes. We transport electricity in a battery. So they take a battery to their homes for running lights and radios and TVs and whatever it is they want to run in their homes. And then when the battery runs out of juice, just like when the propane bottle goes empty, they bring it back to an energy store, which is owned by the community. So the community actually goes into business with the store and yes. they're part of what's going on. That's right. Uh, the community actually establishes its own, uh, what we would call a rural electric co-op. It's like a cooperative uh, owned by the members. And in order to get the energy services, they have to join the cooperative. So they pay money to join the cooperative. We match that with donor funds and uh, then get a, a community established in the distribution of energy at the local level. Wow. I want to encourage you. When God gives us a plan, we don't always know how it's going to end up, like this TV show or whatever it is. But God put it in John's heart about lighting up Africa. And now it's happening. But you know, when I saw the video that he showed us, and we'll show you parts of that in the show today, I saw women carrying wood for miles and miles all day long just to be able to have a fire to cook over. And then when they cooked over that fire, John, the smoke was all inside the village hut there where they lived. Yes. And it was burning their eyes. It's not healthy for their lungs. No. The children were affected by it. Yeah, I think the worst part is that they have open flames in the middle of their living rooms, basically. And toddlers, when the mom's not watching or the mom's out gathering firewood or doing something, toddlers will fall into those fires and get badly burned. Well, what about now the, the light bulb, they can actually see to study and do schoolwork, the kids. Yes, one of the, one of the problems with this kind of light is it's almost impossible to read by. Uh, you can study and you can, you can try hard to read, but it's very hard to read uh, by candlelight. So when we bring in a nice uh, uh, fluorescent light bulb into the home, it lights these homes up so that they can study, they can read the Bibles, they can read their, do their homework, and it makes them able to compete with kids where there is electricity. And see, Jesus is behind all of this. All of so this. as the businesses are being set up and the families are getting involved in it, they're hearing about Jesus and the good news, the gospel. Absolutely. And it's, it's fascinating to watch how these people make an instinctive connection between physical light and spiritual light. And, um, and, and they, they look to God and they give God the glory for what's happening. And, and it gets even more practical than that because uh, in order for a family to get a lighting kit or a cooking kit, we have to train them. We don't want to give them propane in an unsafe way. So they go through two weeks of training and we require the husbands and the wives to both come 
to that training session. During those two weeks of training, the people that do the training tell them about Jesus. They do marriage counseling, and uh, they build into their lives things that they never would have done before. Now this is mostly in Kenya right now, is right where now, you're doing this? We have begun in Kenya. We're now in um, eight, uh, seven communities in Kenya. Those seven communities have about 350,000 people in them, and uh, we're serving about 10% of those people now. Well, now, how is it helping the economy of these people? They, they're not seeing themselves as poor or with a poverty spirit, but how is it bringing them out of that and showing them a way to be economically stronger? You, you, what's fascinating about the, what God's put into us is, first of all, we're very creative beings. And when we unleash, when God unleashes that hope, uh, the creativity that gets unleashed as well is, is uh, it's awesome to watch. We, people are starting things um, that we don't even think of or don't even imagine that, 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 uh, that they could do, whether it's um, educational opportunities or whether it's uh, we, one family is, has gone into the poultry business. They're raising uh, chickens for restaurants now. They're uh, nurseries, so they can, they're growing trees and planting trees, selling trees. And um, just the energy store itself creates traffic. And so around the energy stores, there are cafes bringing up and little restaurants and little, little shops to, uh, to support the people coming and going. Reaping and sowing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as you sow into people's lives, yeah. they begin to reap. You They've, begin to reap as they sow into yeah. others. And a community grows That's out right. of that. Absolutely. Well, now you told me you're also going to Uganda, which we're also, the TV show now, our show is in Uganda every Saturday night over there at 1130 Saturday night. You can watch it out of Kampala, Uganda. <laughs> and so you'll be on the air over there talking about Wonderful. this. Tell, tell the people in Uganda some things about this. Okay, well, we, we, they already know a little bit about us because right. where we are actually uh, centered right now is in a town called Kitali, which is just across the border from Uganda. So we have people from Uganda that, that know what's happening and uh, they're asking us, when are we coming their way? And we will come as fast as God lets us. <laughs> wow, what an awesome vision. Yeah. Listen, you're watching the show. I want to encourage you. I'll put an email address up on the screen for John Coors and Lights Over Africa, the visions God's given them. And I want to encourage you to be a part of this. We've become a part of it. I'm telling everybody about it. You know, it's not every day we get to get in on a vision like this and be able to see God light up a continent that's in darkness. You've always heard of Africa as being a dark continent. Well, Jesus is the light. Whoever yeah. follows him will never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So by lighting up these villages and these homes, the light of Jesus is penetrating the darkness and people are being changed. And that spirit of poverty and that poverty mentality is being changed because all of a sudden they have pride in what they're doing. They can see their children sitting here with a light bulb reading their textbooks and being able to study and learn and go on to higher education. They couldn't have done that before. They go in their homes and the smoke's not burning their eyes and little children are accidentally getting burnt and deformed from fire. Those are life-changing things that are happening to these people. And then they get to go and they have a service center that services the equipment. So now all of a sudden the economy's growing and people will become a part of that. And now other villages hear about it and they want to be a part of it. And so the light is popping up all over Africa. John's sitting on a plane, sees total darkness. It's like nobody's living there on that continent. But now if you fly over, you see lights scattered out over Africa. Only God. Well, John, I would like for you to pray for people. Okay. That God will give them a vision, they'll get a hold of it, and that God will speak to them about being a part of this. Would you pray for I'd people? Love to. All Thank right. You. Our Heavenly Father, you are an incredibly gracious God, and you love those people of Africa more than we could ever imagine. So many of them are your children already, and so many are becoming your children. And Father, you want to minister to them in love. And Father, I thank you that, that you have um, given to me a plan from your heart to help minister to those people. And Father, I pray that, uh, that you would bring others alongside to help as well, because it, it takes 
a lot of help to make uh, to make this happen. It requires help in Kenya from the people there. It requires help in the U.S. and it creates an incredible partnership and and uh, and team to change that continent of Africa for your glory and for your pleasure. And so, Father, I pray for for people that will be seeing this today that you would touch their hearts first of all to respond to the love that you have for them. And if they don't know you, that they would come to know you in a very personal and special way. And for those that do know you, that you would encourage them that you have a great plan for their lives and you have called them to walk in works that uh, they don't even imagine today. And I thank you for all these things that you've done in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. John, I want to thank you for being on the show. You're a blessing. Thank you. I want to thank you for watching the show. Let me tell you, God spoke to my friend and said, you're supposed to have a television show. I didn't want to have a television show. And now I'm sitting here with a television show and it's actually airing in Uganda, Africa. John Coors, didn't want to step away from a business where he was stepping into the top position of that business, been working for it for years. God said, I've got a different plan for you. Trusted God. And now he's lighting up Africa with God's vision and God's help. But he needs our help. We need to get behind this vision that God's given him. If you're in Africa watching, I want to encourage you. Get a hold of the folks over there that are doing this. Be a part of it. What an exciting adventure to be a part of what God's doing in Africa, lighting up a dark continent for Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you to do that. The email address for John will be up on the screen. You can contact him. I want to thank you for watching the show. We'll see you next time on How to Beat the Odds. Think I'll go down to the river Think I'll take myself a swim Let the water cover